elevated Fremantle to the world stage and secured its place as an Australian icon town. The following program is classified PG. The History Channel advises parental guidance is recommended for persons under 15 years. souls who in death have been trapped in some way? Are they unable to leave because of some unfinished business? Have they returned to seek vengeance, to punish the living for crimes against them? Or has their resting place been disturbed? Throughout the world, there are places where over the years there have been many sightings of the supernatural. They say that ghosts return to places where emotions are highly charged, bringing with them grievances and feelings that haven't been resolved. With their enormous energy, they break through into the present. Wander for a time, seeking an end to their pain, and then are folded back into the past, only to return over and over again. Australia's island state of Tasmania has a former penal settlement where almost every house and building is believed to have at least one spirit. Spirits representing the wide cross-section of the settlement's 19th century population, mothers, children, soldiers, servants, and convicts. historic site in southern Tasmania. It was to hear, over a period of 47 years, from 1830, that thousands of secondary offender convicts were sent. Their punishment was forced labor, sometimes in chains. Further misdemeanors were awarded with the lash on the solitary confinement. When the penal colony closed, buildings were made over to private use 
Some became hotels and boarding houses. In 1895 and 1897, bushfires ravaged the township and many buildings were destroyed. But the former convict settlement held a strong fascination for the public. And so came the beginnings of tourism on the peninsula. Visitors arriving by sea and much later by road. Some of the old former convicts preferred to stay on rather than face the world outside and they became the first guides in the development of Port Arthur as a tourist attraction. At the end of the 19th century, the name Port Arthur was not held in high esteem and the town became known as Carnarvon. The lunatic asylum was restored and became the Carnarvon Town Hall. But by 1930, the Port Arthur name had been restored. Today, the Port Arthur historic site is Tasmania's most visited tourist attraction. Trained professional staff providing a variety of services. Knowledgeable guides showing visitors the many points of interest. The penitentiary suffered badly in the fires. Today, skillful engineering has ensured its preservation. Originally, the mill and granary, it housed convicts in dormitories, and for those who misbehaved, in cells. In the 1860s, it had hot and cold running water, flushing toilets. It had a library with 10,000 books, and prisoners were given the opportunity to better themselves. Adjacent to the penitentiary, the guard tower. At the end of the road, the restored commandant's house, a curious mixture of architecture having been added to over the years, most recently when it was a boarding house. The early Port Arthur days saw use of the lash and solitary confinement. In 1842, changes were made with the building of Pentonville Prison in England, the new form of punishment based on isolation and silence. The system was introduced to Port Arthur in the late 1840s with the building of the separate prison. The hospital was a place where prisoners were made well enough to go back to work, not necessarily nursed back to health. But it was here that anaesthetic was used only months after it was discovered by an American dentist. Above the hospital, Smith O'Brien's cottage home to one of the seven Young Islanders, political prisoners of the era. On the hill overlooking the site are the restored homes, the medical officers, the Catholic chaplains, and the magistrates' residences, and along near the church, the accountant's house, and the parsonage. Visitors can board the catamaran Marana for a cruise, passing the shipwright's house above the shipyards where over the years convicts built a great many large vessels. Out in the bay is Point Pua, where convict boys aged from 9 to 19 under rigid discipline had lessons, learned crafts and worked. Many of the convict site's stones were cut by the boys. There's the opportunity to step off on the Isle of the Dead, which was established in 1833. Here, convicts were buried, mostly in unmarked graves. The mounds of earth are still visible. The highest point of the island is the resting place of free settlers, officers, women, children who perished at Port Arthur. On the eve of the 2008 Melbourne Cup, take a journey back through Australia's oldest competitive sport. Everybody loves to win. From the early days on the sandy tracks of colonial Australia to the multi-million dollar modern industry. 1.1 million Kerry Packer. It will be the most emotion-charged Melbourne Cup in history. Perfect jockey. Hosted by John Tapp and Simon Marshall. Come with us and remember the masterful jockeys the skillful trainers and champion horses. He's gonna get that! Yes! The next in the History Channel series, The Spirit of Australian Sport, Horse Racing. Premiers Monday, 7.30.
on the History Channel. Three chords and the truth. 35 of the greatest songs ever written. From a time where songs had a message. Three chords and the truth. There's a story in every song. The man should have silenced the critics when he beat Green and Solomon. But there are still some who think Mundine's opponents are easy. Ooh, another one to Mundine on my scorecard. Mundine will leave no doubt when he faces South America's best. 31 from 33 middleweight titles. Rafael Soso Pintas. And a hand theater in boxing, gentlemen, and we've got some right now. This is Mundine's next step on his way to a middleweight title. Mundine beat Pintas. Live Wednesday, November 12 at 7 p.m. on Main Event Pay-Per-View. November on CR. What were these drivers thinking as they led the police on the world's most dangerous high-speed pursuits? I can't believe that that's me. Find out in the fast-paced, high-impact new series, Why I Ran. The battered and bloodied body of a 30-year-old woman is found by her family. The truth behind who killed her is closer than you dared imagine. In the world premiere of Crime Investigation Australia, Evil Heart, the murder of Donna Wheeler. Let's go. Get behind the wheel with the hard men of the Auto Theft Task Force as they track down, Do it now. take down, and lock up America's car thieves. This job security. <laughs> in the brand new series, Jacked. A maximum security breakout sparks a massive manhunt. I'm not gonna die, no man in prison. The race is on to stop the bandits as their stockpile of weapons grows. Will the law catch up with them? The hunt for the Texas 7. November on CI. Throughout the ages, there have been creatures that have captured the imagination of civilizations and cultures worldwide. Monsters. Could they exist? It's just a mystery. The search continues as history presents an all-new series of the thrilling Monster Quest. New episode Thursdays, 10.30 on the History Channel. In March 1999, a new visitor center opened, providing interpretation gallery, restaurant and other facilities. Its forerunner was the Broad Arrow Cafe and Shop, the scene on April the 28th, 1996, of a modern-day tragedy, when a lone gunman killed 35 Australian and overseas visitors and staff. The memorial gardens alongside commemorate the terrible event. This, then, is the setting in which many people have found themselves experiencing something unexplainable. Many of them convinced the supernatural is at work. Documentation of reported sightings of ghosts at Port Arthur date from the 1870s and has continued through to the present day. But not all sightings have been at night. A separate or silent prison was a place of punishment for convicts who had committed further misdemeanors while at Port Arthur. Many people have had a feeling of utter despair in here. Over the past few decades, an ongoing program of archaeology has been conducted. One day a worker decided to take her lunch break exploring the model prison. When she didn't return, her colleague went looking for her and found her, huddled in a cell in a fetal position weeping and unable to move. Similarly, an old man was found in the same cell, curled up and crying. He had lived through World War II and had lost his family, but had never experienced such despair as he did in this cell. it is the despair of William Carter who committed suicide in this cell in 1867. 
to achieve his end was a long and difficult process. He hanged himself with the leather strap used to bind his bedding, tying it to the eyelets that held his hammock, then simply sat down. A painful, slow death. Suicide was a mortal sin, but he believed that nothing could be worse than the hell that was Port Arthur. Not surprisingly, there are ghosts here. Ghosts who've been seen and on occasions heard. One day, members of a tour party visiting the separate prison saw over the guide's shoulder a man peering from a cell door opposite. As the guide turned to look, the figure faded and disappeared. The prison's first rule was total silence. No one was allowed to speak. Even the guards used sign language and wore felt slippers. The prisoners were kept in total solitude. Outside the cells, they wore a mask with two eye holes. If they committed any further misdemeanors, they were confined to the dark cell. Its walls are a meter thick. Once the four doors leading to it are closed, there is total darkness, total silence. It took only three to four days in here to break a man's spirit. Some may have been driven to lunacy. By 1867, a lunatic asylum had been built next door. Many of Port Arthur's ghostly sightings relate to events that occurred there during the site's convict history. Legend has it that the church was never consecrated because of the murders committed there. But the accepted reason is that more than one denomination used the building. The church was decorated with 13 spires and a 60-foot steeple built on top of the belfry with a huge iron cockerel above. It was said that if the cockerel ever came to ground, the colony would close. In 1876, a fierce tornado occurred. The steeple came down, embedding the cockerel in a tree. Sure enough, the prison closed the following year. In 1884, fire swept through the church and ivy took over the abandoned walls. But there was one place where ivy would not grow. In 1836, two convicts were fixing the leads on the roof. One died after falling heavily to the ground, his blood staining the wall. In later years, ivy grew profusely over the walls, but never in that place. He may have been pushed. Other convict workers claimed they saw nothing. Perhaps they were afraid to say. December 1835, a convict work party was digging the foundations for the new church. As Joseph Shuttleworth and William Riley worked together, Riley raised his pickaxe, striking Shuttleworth to the head. Many believed it was a pact between the two men. Shuttleworth would be murdered. Riley would be executed. Both would die at the hands of others, and no suicide being involved would be accepted into heaven. For two desperate men, it was the only way to escape. But did they? Or are there ghosts still imprisoned there?
there have been unexplained flashes of light around the church. At night, a face can be seen high up in the church's masonry, but in daylight, it's not there. Just along from the church is the parsonage, home of the various Church of England ministers during the convict era. Without doubt, this building can be counted amongst Australia's most haunted. The Reverend George Eastman lived here from 1857 to 1870 with his wife and 10 children. The hauntings began soon after his death. The Reverend Haywood and his wife being first to experience the supernatural manifestations. One night, the local doctor, seeing the lights on upstairs at the parsonage, called to pay his respects, believing that Mrs. Haywood had arrived home from Hobart Town. But on answering the door, Mr. Haywood assured him she hadn't. He and the servants were in the back room downstairs. The two men inspected upstairs, which they found was in total darkness. Next day, others in the settlement also reported seeing the lights. Mysterious lights continue to trouble Mr. and Mrs. Hayward. Sitting in their drawing room one night, they noticed a brilliant light streaming from under the door of the room opposite. Sure enough, on looking through the keyhole, they saw the room was ablaze with light. But on opening the door, nothing. Once again, complete darkness. On one occasion, the Roman Catholic chaplain was summoned away from Port Arthur and the Haywards invited his sister to stay with them. That night, she was woken by loud knocking and banging all over the room. She let out a piercing scream and rushed up to Mrs. Hayward's bedroom. The patter of feet followed her up the stairs. Mr. Hayward looked over the banisters, but seeing nothing, went back to bed. Next thing, there was the sound of knocking on his door. He opened it and saw nothing. That same guest chamber was the scene of another frightening event. One evening, a servant entered it to check the fire. To her horror, she saw the figure of a man looking through the window. He held on high a knife or dagger as if to strike. Thereafter, nothing would ever induce her to enter that room after dark. Surprisingly, the Haywood still had doubts about the parsonage being haunted. So one night after the children had gone to bed, they hid themselves on the landing it wasn't long before footsteps headed across the hallway to the stairs and began to climb. The footsteps came up and stopped a few feet in front of them, paused, and then slowly, deliberately, pointedly, turned and went back downstairs. Next day, the Haywards moved out. A moment in time, a split second, the blink of an eye, and suddenly life hangs in the balance. From presidents to popes, from revolutionaries to royals, examine in detail events that led up to some of the most notorious assassination attempts in history. straight and say, Commander, I'm sorry. For a brief moment, the world stood still, and nothing would be the same again.
infamous assassinations. Starts Monday, 6.30 on the History Channel. Into a world of escalating media costs, never-ending demands for increased sales, comes an idea right for its time. Paper Lead TV. No more media bills to pay. This time, you pay for results, not promises. Paper Lead TV. Brought to you by experts in sales lead generation. Say no to media bills. Pay only for independently audited, documented, give them to the sales team leads. From the agency that puts its money where its mouth is. No more media bills to pay. Pay per lead TV. This could change everything. Weeknights on Bio. Real stories about real people. From six. Stories that astound the mind. Can't come here with a cute smile and a story and no proof. Judge Judy Double. At seven, stories that touch the soul. He wants me to tell you that you fulfilled him in ways that he never expected. Beyond with James Van Prague. At 7.30, stories that warm the heart. I think I might be running a marathon anyway. RPA. At eight, stories that break the spirit. Make up the stuff. Who do you think does? People like you. Airline USA. Everyone has a story, and we're telling them. Weeknights from six on Bio. 2008 marks the 90th anniversary of the end of World War I, and the History Channel is taking what has become a lifelong ambition for many Australians and New Zealanders, a pilgrimage to the hallowed beaches of Gallipoli. Every Tuesday night in November, we'll be taking you on a tour of where the Anzac legend began, plus a series of special documentaries on what was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Gallipoli, the first D-Day. Lessons learned from this ill-fated invasion are used almost 30 years later on the more well-known D-Day. He relied very heavily on specialised armour. Winning World War I, the Western Front Diaries, reveals just how vital a role the Anzacs played in the Great War. This is the story of their greatest battle. The Somme, from defeat to victory, the true story of a group of English mates who fought in the bloodiest of battles. And Gallipoli, untold stories, the Anzac legend in the words of the last Gallipoli veterans. It was just a hail of bullets. 90 years on, take a journey to where the Anzac legend began. Join me, Matt McLaughlin, Tuesday nights at 7.30 on the History Channel. During restoration at Port Arthur, three builders, one of them an apprentice, were accommodated at the parsonage. One of the builders was wakened by a drumming sound and whimpering from his dog, which was frantically scratching at the door to get out. He looked over to the other bed and found the apprentice kicking the wall, the upper half of his body rigid, his hands in front of him, as though he was trying to push against something and sit up. He'd been awakened by a feeling of someone heavy kneeling on his chest. He couldn't move. He tried to scream but felt icy cold hands wrap themselves tightly around his neck, trying to strangle him. He was carried outside. And next day, red marks appeared around his throat. It is said that young children and animals are often the most sensitive to the presence of ghosts. Perhaps the dog had seen more than the men. Another event in recent times occurred when a ghost tour party was outside the parsonage. A chill wind sprang up and the gate next door at the accountant's house began banging madly whilst lights were seen flashing in the upstairs windows of the parsonage. They left and the mayhem ceased. So who is this violent spirit? And so every one of you is one of God's children. You have been chosen to be here in penal servitude and should you choose salvation, you will find that there is glory. The Reverend Eastman had been a forceful presence in Port Arthur, huge, energetic, often arguing with the authorities. A real fire and brimstone sermonizer who would thunder doom from the pulpit. But there is a chance for your salvation. You must take that chance. You must down and the Lord will deal with you. One, every one of you, be cast into a pit of fire. After his death, he no longer had a pulpit. But has he found another way to continue his influence at Port Arthur? The Isle of the Dead out in the bay of Port Arthur may give us a clue. The inscription on his gravestone comes from the book of Hebrews. He being dead, yet speaketh. Here.
experiences at the parsonage, she seems drawn to children. One night, a guest at the house saw her enter the bedroom, strike a light, and gaze for some time at her sleeping child. Then silently glide from the room. The same blue lady has been seen on the parsonage veranda and drifting along the passageways. Further evidence that children are more sensitive to the appearance of ghosts occurred when a three-year-old girl left her mother and ran along the veranda, holding her arms up to be lifted. Her mother called her back, and the child explained, that lady over there lives here, and she wants to play with me. So long ago, an English couple came to Port Arthur tracing a family tree. They carried old letters from a young woman to her mother. She was married to the accountant, and they lived next door to the parsonage. She was forced by the nature of the prison to spend her days cooped up in the house, but she made friends with a minister's wife who invited her to walk in the parsonage garden. A later letter announced her first pregnancy. But we learn she died in the house a few hours after giving birth to a stillborn son. The minister wouldn't baptize a dead child, and so he could not be buried in a Christian cemetery. It is believed he was buried in the garden. In recent years, a couple passing the parsonage late one afternoon took a photo of the building. And when it was developed, found an image of a baby clearly visible in the left-hand window. Perhaps he and his mother are still searching for one another. The Commandant's house was a family home, and there is strong evidence it was the scene of several tragedies involving a child, a father, and a nanny. Nanny's jobs would have involved looking after the children and running the house, and there's evidence she's still jealously guarding her domain, even today. visitor walked into Nanny's room at the back of the house and saw a woman sitting in the rocking chair. Brandishing the stick, she rudely ordered the woman to get herself and everybody else out. The visitor recognized the dialect as old Liverpoolian. doesn't want you to stay very long or mess things up. Her bad temper has seen watches stop, cameras work overtime, or not at all, yet behave perfectly in other parts of the house. Unexplained images have been seen in photos which have partially been exposed. The rockers on her chair are worn almost flat, yet it has been seen to rock by itself.
Late one afternoon, two tourists saw a young girl enter the commandant's house through a side door. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, wore a blue dress with a white pinafore. Upon inquiry, they were told that no one lived in the house, and in fact, it had been locked since closing time at the end of the day. This same little girl was sighted twice by different people. Both times, she was at the bottom of the steps with blood running through her hair. She couldn't use one of her arms, and she was calling for help. It sounded like mummy, but could have been nanny. There was another sighting the following day, and when these were researched, it was discovered that there'd been 10 sightings of this little girl over the years. One of the people who saw her thought her name started with an A or an E. The other thought her name was Amy or Emily. It is believed the little girl may be Amelia Jane Booth, daughter of Charles O'Hara Booth, who was commandant in charge of the settlement from 1833 to 1844. Amelia was therefore Nanny's responsibility. Nanny feels she failed in her duty. Perhaps it is her guilty conscience that keeps her bound to the house. One day a visitor looking for her little girl heard her chatting amiably with someone. She traced the voice to the commandant's bedroom and found her daughter beside the bed talking to the empty pillow. Her mother asked her to come. No, I'm having a nice talk with this man here who's very sick. On telling the guide, they returned to the room where they found a perfect indentation of a man's body on the mattress. On another occasion, an elderly couple reported to a guide that there was a man in a soldier's uniform standing at the window of the commandant's bedroom looking sadly out over Port Arthur and weeping. Poor man, he looked in such pain. The same woman who Nanny chased out of her room afterwards went with the guide to the commandant's room. Another shock was in store for her. Lying on the bed was a man who was very ill and in great pain. She later identified the man from his portrait. He was Charles O'Hara Booth. Booth loved to explore the bush, and on one of his excursions in 1838, he became lost. When the searchers found him, he was exhausted, starving, and almost dead. He pulled through, but two or three times a year, he would take to his bed with a sudden fever and an overwhelming feeling of weakness. He was in great pain, physically and emotionally. One day a guide peered through a window and was horrified to see the face of a man staring back. His tour party was scared, but two men ventured back and shining a torch into the hallway saw the furniture moving about violently. Yet on checking next morning, everything was back in its place. <coughs> Booth's reputation was that of a man who ruled a prison with a rod of iron. Psychics have described seeing a man who died a painful death and who has two graves. In one sense, he does. The memorial erected to him above the commandant's jetty and his grave where he was buried in 1851 
at the Hobart suburb of Newtown. Perhaps he weeps for the suffering he caused. It's abundantly clear that this was a troubled household. No wonder Nanny wants us out. If you look at those diaries, you can get a real feel for what really happened there. The 8th of August, 1916, they found themselves surrounded. This sense of innocence about them. They don't know enough about this story. They don't know enough about the men who died here. 250,000 fought. 46,000 did not return. They learn an entirely new war on the Western Front. They certainly played above their weight. How our Anzacs helped win the Great War. Winning World War I, the Western Front Diaries, premieres Remembrance Day on the History Channel. Three chords and the truth. 35 of the greatest songs ever written. From a time where songs had a message. Three chords and the truth. There's a story in every song. The Robertsons love their sport. Nice tackle, love. And with sport on every day, every day is a celebration. But then there's change of season day, an almost religious celebration, where they say goodbye to the winter sports and welcome in the summer ones. Is anything more beautiful than tie me in feathers and call me Doris? For lovers of sport everywhere, here's wishing you a happy change of season. Words of Tracy Powers. Shark. I don't go by that anymore. He may be a hotshot prosecutor. Yassi, get a warrant. But now he's in need of help. Something doesn't smell right. I go down. They're going with me. Can he save himself? Oh, God, you have a plan. I do. Now it's payback time. Just glaze on our side. How's he going to come out squeaky clean? Shark, Sunday, 7.30. New to W. Foxsports.com.au is your sweet spot for online during Australia's Tour of India. Download the daily scoreboard and get real-time results sent straight to your desktop. It doesn't get any bigger than this. Cricket on Fox Sports? How good is it? War crosses all borders, generations and classes. War unites us, divides us and conquers all. But what are the real facts behind history's greatest battles? In a unique series, which features rare archival footage, explore the realities of war. War Files, next on the History Channel. Until the 1870s, it was illegal to perform a dissection on a free person. Prisoners' bodies were not protected, however, and in determining causes of death, Port Arthur's doctors also had the opportunity to learn about anatomy. Most autopsies were performed at the hospital, but some dissections were carried out in the basement of the senior surgeon's house. From the fireplace in the room upstairs, ashes from the grate were tipped down a funnel into the dissecting room to mop up the blood and bodily fluids. On one tour, a father and a teenager looked over the guide's shoulder and clearly saw a face staring back at them from the hole. Others have experienced someone's cold breath on the back of their neck. Hauntings have continued here into the 20th century. In the 1920s, this was a guest house. A lady going to bed heard a tapping at the window and saw a little girl looking back at her. She opened the window but saw no one. She went back to bed and the knocking started again, but this time more frantically, and the child was back.
A lady in a tour group noticed a child hanging back from the group. Thinking she was lost, said, shouldn't you be with us? Oh no, it's all right. I have to go home now. And with that, the little girl walking away disappeared. where the ghosts of children gather. A psychic has provided five names. Martin Clark, who died of dysentery. Janet, who is looking for her mother, who died. Carolyn Rutter, who is looking for her parents. Sarah, who drowned. And Jamie, a 16 or 17 year old. Life would have been difficult for a child at Port Arthur, struggling to find joy and play in the middle of a prison world. They couldn't avoid the sight and sound of the beatings or the fear that infected everyone's lives. Mark Jeffrey was the convict grave digger on the Isle of the Dead. He lived in a wooden hut alongside the burial ground. He was a tough fighter and was happy there until one night. Lookouts back at the prison saw a signal fire on the island. Investigating, they found Geoffrey in a state of sheer panic, vowing he'd had a personal visit from his satanic majesty and demanding to be taken off immediately and for good. An early grave on the Isle of the Dead is that of Private Robert Young, whose ghost has been a regular visitor to Port Arthur. Private Young and a party of convicts had ferried the doctor by longboat to the boys' prison at Point Pua. On their return, the doctor left the boat. On hearing a scream and splash, ran back to the jetty and found that Private Young had fallen into the water. Two convicts were recovering the body. Had he slipped? Had he been pushed overboard? Had there been an escape attempt? Over a period of years, three women staying in Jetty Cottage on the other side of the bay have reported a sighting, documenting their experience in detail. The women were unknown to each other, but the individual documentations matched exactly. They tell of waking and feeling drawn to the window and of hearing a woman screaming and crying. They experience strong feelings of nausea and looking out across the water see the image of a soldier floating above the Jetty steps. Henry Belfield was a boy of 17 when he was sent back to Port Arthur to serve two years hard labor in chains. He believed another youth, Thomas Boardman, was responsible for this punishment and sought revenge. On the 28th of December, 1841, whilst the two were together on a work gang in the bush, Belfield persuaded Boardman to accompany him to a creek to get a drink of water. Out of sight of the rest of the gang, he seized a heavy piece of wood and bashed and then stabbed Boardman, leaving part of the knife buried in his neck. He then left him for dead and reported that he had absconded. It was some days before another convict found Boardman still alive, but in a shocking condition. Boardman survived long enough to identify his attacker and Belfield was committed for trial in Hobart Town. Whilst waiting for transportation, Belfield was held prisoner in the guard tower, where legend has it he was taunted by the guards, who explained in lurid detail what it was like to hang. been reports of hearing a boy's screams and men's laughter from the tower at night.
There are skeptics who scoff at the ghostly tales of Port Arthur. But then again, there are skeptics who are skeptics no more. Having experienced for themselves some phenomenon that simply cannot be explained. Time and time again, hard-headed, down-to-earth, nerveless people have found that the total disbelief they have had has been challenged by a strange, unfathomable event which has left them frightened, disturbed, or, at the very least, bewildered. Those who come to Port Arthur should be mindful of the fact that, day or night, there's more to this reminder of a brutal past than one might think. There are too many memories. Too much has happened here, for there not to be spirits who, for one reason or another, are destined to linger on. November.